Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for these words that you've given us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for writing them down, inspiring Paul to write these, these fantastic principles that we have. We thank you so much for all the many rich blessings that we enjoy, as, just as, as believers and just knowing that we belong to you. What a tremendous blessing that is. I pray that we can uh, learn and just grow and have a revival in our spirits, a revival that just, just goes beyond anything we've ever experienced before so that we can be mighty and strong, be lions for the kingdom and go out there and share the gospel with everyone we meet. How we love you, Lord, how we thank you. We just give you honor, glory, and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said? Amen. Amen. We're dealing with the book of Romans. We're in lesson three, and we're still in the introduction phase. And in this case, we're dealing with uh, what God, uh, how Paul wants to uh, start off at the beginning with a greeting or as part of his way of just starting the process of inter introducing the book of Romans. So remember that uh, Paul has not ever been to Rome at this point. He is writing from Corinth and, uh, and uh, across the way in the sea. Then you'll find Rome. But what's going to happen is later he will visit Rome, but under different circumstances, he'll be there as a prisoner. And, uh, but at this point in time, he's looking at the kind of like the society that he's seeing and he, uh, there in Corinth, and he says, he's looking at so many people that are wishy-washy, so many people that are one foot in, in the world and the other foot in, in this new Christianity that they're learning. And so for them, he's looking at them, he's trying to correct these things with Corinth, but he also knows that there's a, the congregation that's really getting big is the one in Rome. And so that was not founded by Peter or any of the apostles or Paul. That was founded by believers that had come into, uh, into Jerusalem for the, that were Jews and became believers in Jerusalem uh, there uh, for, uh, for Pentecost. And then from there, they go back home because they were part of the, what they call the diaspora, the, the ones that had gone, uh, Jews that had gone out to other lands. And so as they go back to their lands, they're spreading the gospel. Well, that had happened and they, as they had gotten back to Rome, and now you have a good-sized church taking place there in Rome. And mostly of Jewish believers that, that founded it, and then Greeks or, or uh, Gentiles now that were coming in, learning of it, and they in turn were taking it to their parts of the world. So all the roads lead to Rome, but then all the roads lead out of Rome. And the good thing about that is the gospel was part of that. So it's, it's an awesome uh, idea of how God strategically put them in. So this, the book of Romans was to say, I know what I'm seeing here. I need to warn or I need to put some rules down so that people will know how to live for Jesus. That's the main thing. And so he sends that out. And then as a result of that, he says, if they grow, they will not be ashamed of the gospel. And as a result, they will spread the word. And so this is also a tremendous encouragement to them. But this is all about doctrine. And this is where we get most of our doctrine as believers. So if we learn it, it'll start producing something we call revival in our hearts as we start going over those things that we've forgotten. And then we come and put Jesus in the proper place. And uh, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then everything else will be added onto that. So that's the good news. So lesson three in the introduction. The, the revelation of righteousness will be in Romans 1 through 17. We won't go as far as 17. I think we'll go as far as 12. But let's look at these. The first 17 verses of the letters to the Romans are introductory and concern the revelation of righteousness. In other words, how do you get righteous? The one thing that Martin Luther, when he was uh, 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 first in the Reformation, he, as a monk, he could not understand the idea of how you could get righteousness. How do you get righteousness from God? I mean, how in the, we're all kind of a mess, and how is it possible? Because they were conferring righteousness to whoever the church at the time, the Catholic Church, was just bestowing righteousness according to their rules and according to who was paying indulgences or who wanted it, would do the, the will of the mother church type of thing, the organization. But he's saying, like, there's something else. There's another way of getting God's righteousness. And he, when he asked the question, he found it in the book of Romans. That was one other revival that we can look at in history where Romans is being used for that. So 
Um, they provide the reasons for the writing of this epistle before spelling out the theme. So the first thing is you have the salutation, and that is the greeting. The greeting from 1 through 7 of chapter 1. Romans 1 through 7, it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David and according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. So he's saying you have this opportunity, you have this heritage that God has given you to be able to go out and do that. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the, the opening se section. Somebody was talking about the fact that when you would get a letter, <laughs> we think in terms of letter and pages, but, in, but think of it in terms of a roll. And so usually you would address the, the, the person to, to Rome, and then you'd have to unscroll 16 chapters to find out who wrote it <laughs> at the bottom <laughs> from Paul. So in order to do that, he writes right, right off the bat, he says, let me tell you who I am and what, I'm, what the purpose is and so forth. And that's why he's writing it with his name on the front. In verses 1 through 7, Paul defined his position and the position of his readers in relation to God. By doing so, he spelled out the unifying element that would be true for him and the recipients throughout the epistle. In other words, I'm one of you guys and you're one of, one of me. We all have something in common. What is those things that we have in common? Very simply, we are unrighteous people, but through Jesus, we became the righteousness of God, which is impossible to do outside of Jesus. Amen? So it says, by, uh, verse 1 reveals the identity of the author. Paul, a servant of Messiah Yeshua, called to be an apostle, separated into the gospel of God. The English name Paul comes from the Latin Paulus, which means small or humble. A concept taught in many churches is that when Paul was a Jew, he was called Shaul, or Saul. But when he became a Christian and was no longer a Jew, he took on a Christian name. Okay, that is absolutely false. Okay, this assumption, this assumption is wrong on three counts. Leave it up to Dr. Frudenbaum to give us three counts, not just one, but three counts of why this is false. And very simply, a Jew, who, uh, first a Jew who, became, who becomes a believer in the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, does not lose his Jewish identity. Amen? He does not become a Gentile believer, which is what many people associate with the term Christian. Now, a good, a good illustration of that in the past, not, not so much now, of course, but in the past, it was that if you were Jewish, and you came to know the Lord, then the pastor or the, the elders or somebody would want you to prove your faithfulness to being a Christian and to let go of anything that was Jewish. Because they thought the requirement is you can't bring anything Jewish into it because you're no longer Jew. You're now a Christian. So what they would do is they would have a ham sandwich and they would have him eat it in front of all the elders to prove his rejection of, of, uh, of Jewish thought that you can't eat pork, and this by means that uh, that was your way of baptism, of getting into the congregation. They would not let you be a member unless you would do that. Amazing. And the whole concept there was that they thought that God was finished with the Jews, therefore there was only, only Jews, uh, unbelievers, and then Christians. There was nothing in between. I served for 17 years in a Messianic Jewish congregation that was Jew and Gentile, both worshiping the Lord in a Jewish setting, in a synagogue setting, but of course, everything being with a biblical understanding of the New Testament and so forth. So I know, I, I, I've, I've heard the stories of how difficult it was and so forth. And also on the Jewish side, the Jewish people would look at their son and their son would come, guess what, I figured out who, Yeshua, who, who the Messiah is. And they said, well, who's the Messiah? It's Yeshua, it's Jesus. And they would say, if you continue to believe that, then there is no room in this house for you. And then the father would proclaim, you are dead to me. 
and then they would go ahead and have a funeral for that child. Basically, he no longer exists. Unless, of course, he changes his mind and comes back to Judaism. So in that, in that idea, with, with, when Jews for Jesus was coming up, they, they, this goes back you know, 50 years or whatever, he, that was the main issue. The, the Jews for Jesus were thought of as the worst people in the world because they were making traitors out of the Jewish people. And in their view, once a Jews for Jesus would tell the, the truth as we know it, to a Jewish person, he accepted that, he automatically stopped being a Jew. In both cases, it's both completely wrong because what happens is that you very much keep your Jewish identity as you go on. In fact, who better to keep their Jewish identity than to identify with the Jewish Messiah? Amen? Okay. So then, uh, second, Paul never changed his name. This is, this is interesting. People think that, well, when he was Jewish, he was Saul, but when he became a believer, he kind of ejected that and became Paul. But that's not the case. He always had those two names to begin with. Always. Nothing changed here. Here's what happened. Paul never changed his name. Rather, Jews in the diaspora or those that had been outside of Israel always had two names. One would be a Gentile name and one would be a Jewish name. This is still true of most Jews in the present dispersion. So it was not uncommon for him to have that. Okay? Also, he had Roman citizenship. As a Roman citizen, he would have a second name automatically because as a, as a Roman, he could identify as Paul and as a Jew, as Shaul. Okay? Third, there was no such thing as a Christian name in the first century AD. The Latin name Paulus was very common, and other scriptures such as in Acts 13, 7 mention pagans by this name. Here's a good example, Acts chapter 13, verse 7. It says, who was with the proconsul, talking about Paul, Sergius Paulus. Notice his name? That's his name. He's the proconsul that's there, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul, or Saul, and sought to hear the word of God. And here you have where he is with Paulus there, uh, and, and he is being referred to as Saul. Hence the name does not indicate one's spiritual condition as a saved or unsaved person. This, first speaks, this verse speaks about Paul's other name, Shaul, in Acts 13.9, which simply states, but Shaul, he also, who is also called Paul, so he says, but Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fastened his eyes on him. And there you have where he uses both of them. It says, Saul also called Paul. Okay? The verse makes it very clear that Paul never changed his name. The real question is why, as of Acts 13, he was no longer called Shaul, but Paulus. The answer is the beginning of the be at the beginning in chapter 13, Paul went out to the Gentiles, and from that point on, he journeyed among the Gentiles. Hence, he was known by his Gentile name. And to be able to show that, I went ahead and I printed up Acts chapter 13. Not all of it, but some of it. It says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with a Herod, uh, Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. This is, the, this is a missionary journey that they leave from Antioch, first missionary journey. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. This is John Mark. Now, when they had gone through the island to Pathos, Pathos they found a certain sorcerer a false prophet, a Jew who was named Bar-Jesus, who was the proconsul, who was, I'm sorry, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and brought to hear the word of God. But Elemas, the sorcerer, for his own name is translated, withstood them seeking to turn proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, <clears throat> you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? 
And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw that he had been, what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga, to Pamphylia, and John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So at this point in time, this is when you see the transfer right here. So after, after chapter 13 of Acts, now he's referred to as Paul. Not because he was a Jew one day and became a Gentile the next based on his name. He already had those names way before. Okay? Hope that makes sense. Paul was from the city of Tarsus and thus a Jew of the Diaspora, which means anybody living outside of the land. In Romans, Paul called himself a servant of <coughs> Messiah Yeshua. The Greek term for a servant, doulos, could be translated as bond slave. The difference between a slave and a bond slave is that a slave usually had no choice. He became a slave for reasons beyond his control. For instance, when a Jew fell into debt that he could not repay, his only option was to sell himself into slavery. Now, most, <clears throat> most people don't understand what slavery, the issue of slavery was, or servants were at the time of Jesus, or at, the, at this time, at the time of Paul. And what you had is if you found yourself in debt, didn't know how to get out of it, there was no other way to pay that debt off or whatever, then what you would do is you would go to somebody who had money and say, I'd like to go ahead and sell myself to you for your services. And according to the law, he had to serve him for six years. But at the, at the end of the sixth year, he would be released to be free altogether. Okay? So they would do that themselves. So it was like, I have nowhere to go. I need a place where I can have three meals a day working and, and, and have a roof over my head and so forth. And hopefully they're choosing the right master to be able to do that, that, that maybe has a good reputation for treating his servants right and so forth. But that was the whole thing. It was a voluntary thing that said, I'm in a jam, I need help. And they would go ahead and basically hire themselves out for six years until they could get out. The seventh one, then they would be released. It was like a year of jubilee type thing for them. So they got a chance to do that. So he says, for instance, when a Jew fell into debt that he could not repay, his only option was to sell himself into slavery. However, under the Mosaic law, he had to be released the seventh year of servitude. As the seventh year came up, that was your year. Then when he had the option of enjoying his freedom by walking away from his master, or he could continue to work for him. By willingly binding himself to permanent slavery, he would become a bond slave, meaning a slave by choice. So there's a, this is an excellent view here, because I did this illustration kind of to, to help you understand. Uh, so the first, the first stage that this, a person would be in, uh, when it comes to the spiritual view, is the fact that we're slave to sin, we're slave, and basically our father is Satan, right? And as a result of that, we have the situation where we're an unbeliever, we don't have any relationship with God and so forth, so we continue on just the way we're going. If a person continues on just the way they're going in this state, then they will perish and go to hell and then to be transferred to the lake of fire forever. So that's, that's an understanding. But what happens here is we now get bought out. We get bought out of the slave market of sin, and it, it, we're being brought out by the, the one who's paying for that debt. So when that happens, then we have freedom. Freedom from what? To do whatever we feel like it? No, to be able to have freedom from being into slavery that will take us into the pit of hell. Okay? So because of that, this freedom here is bought with a price. So now we transfer ownership. When we transfer ownership, then now he has bought us. We are now God's property. And as a result of that, now we have the opportunity to, to, to work out our relationship with God as a bond servant. And the bond servant basically is now, I choose not to be under that and uh, under that slavery. I choose to be under your, uh, you being the master of my life. And now because of the thankfulness that I don't have to pay the consequences of unbelief, then now I have the freedom to be able to serve. Now, this is the difference. 
where, you, where are you in this relationship of serving? Because now this really goes from, I now have him as my savior. Now I want him as my Lord. I now have this freedom, not a freedom to do whatever you feel like it, but now I have the freedom to serve with such, uh, the scriptures talk about the fact that where Jesus said, take my yoke. My yoke is easy and it's light. And so over here, the burden of that yoke of sin was dragging us down. We didn't even know it, how, how, how heavy it was. But then we understood when we found the peace and the freedom. But now what? Well, now that we have this peace and now that we have a new master, now he is like our king. And we see him as our king. And now we have to look at it in terms of now as a bond slave, what is our responsibility? Well, the responsibility that we have is to love God with all our heart, mind, and soul. Our responsibility that we have is to serve him. Our responsibility that we have is to take the time to be able to show the love of God to other people. To love God with, with no reservation. To be able to, to just look at him and say, what is it that you want? Tell me what you want on an everyday basis. To be able to see somebody in need, to be able to fill the need in the name of Jesus. Now, the king will reward each and every one of his bond slaves. That's the beauty of the whole thing, is that not only do we get all the benefits in this world, we get all the benefits in the next world. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's what we're looking for. And that's why this is so important. Now, what I put here are degrees, because the bottom line is that a person can just come to know the Lord and do a little bit under uh, you know for the lord it's kind of like for instance like the the different types of soils that uh, god talks about it in a parable some fall in some seed some sort uh, and, and uh, some seed is taken away by the bird so there's no salvation there but then there's three other type of soils and in those soils those soils talk about how the commitment level is of each person who receives the gospel and so what happens here is the same thing happens here it is when a person comes to know the Lord, what kind of gratitude and joy and understanding do you have of what Jesus has done for you, that you now serve him, and with what type of uh, passion will you have to serve him? That will make for great things to happen in your life. It may cause persecution. It may cause uh, suffering. It can cause a lot of joy. It's so many things. But the bottom line is our job is not to be successful. Our job is to be faithful. Faithful to the king. That's it. Once we understand that, then we're not having to compare ourselves with somebody else. Because if we do that, we say, well, that guy doesn't do anything, so I'm doing a little bit more that makes me more spiritual. But if you look over here, this guy's doing way more than what you're doing. How come you didn't look at that side? We're always looking at, compared to Hitler, we're pretty good, <laughs> right? Okay. So that's what this is. And so he's saying how important it is. And when he calls himself a bondservant, he is the epitome of a bondservant who came from unbelief as a slave to sin, even though he was a Pharisee, yet he was persecuting the believers on the road to Damascus. Then Jesus comes, gives them freedom. And then what does he do? He goes and gets taught by God, by Jesus himself, for 10 years in the desert and then comes back out. And this first trip that we talked about earlier is him going out, and talking to the Gentile world. As the apostle of the Gentiles, he could see nothing more to, that was more important than to get the gospel out to the world. That's awesome. The reason, if you're a Gentile here, and chances are that you are, then uh, you came as a result of the teaching that was spread out throughout the world, and it was going out through everywhere, everywhere basically. And so we have so much to be thankful for. So look at yourself and ask the question, okay, I knew that I was an unbeliever. Okay, we all understand that. For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then we came to a knowledge of Jesus and we accepted him as our, our savior in our, in, in our lives. And we believe that the cross is what saved us. And then we look and say, but what are we doing with it now? That's the question. Sometimes I don't like to ask the question even for myself. As soon as I ask the question for myself, then I have to be accountable to it. And then as I look at that, and I go like, golly, I'm not doing nearly enough stuff. We have a situation where we have uh, 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 this young man uh, who is in the hospital, and uh, he's been in a coma 
And uh, when uh, we were, uh, when my wife was asked about uh, could somebody go and do visitation and stuff, I didn't really, I didn't, didn't even, I wasn't sensitive enough to think uh, what the possibilities were of us going over there and talking to him. Because when you hear that somebody's in a coma, somehow you think, Okay, well, he's in a coma. You know, I guess we can pray. You know, we can go over it. But you're trying to figure out, well, what, how does that work? You know, going to a person who's comatose. And we went and stuff. And then when I heard my wife say those words, she, she said, I, 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 I think that you can hear me. I'm almost positive you can hear me. And if you can hear me, I need for you to hear this. And then it dawned on me and going like, oh, my goodness, that's right. I just remembered people who are in comas can actually hear you know, sometimes they, they talk about, I hurt the doctors, I hurt this, and, you know, that type of thing when they wake up. So then it energized me because I realized, and I thought, oh, man, how dull did I get that I didn't even remember that right off the bat, that I was thinking in terms of, well, what, what good would that do? I mean, could we not just pray for him here? And we could have, and, and, and God could have heard, but just the idea of him hearing the word of God, that was the, that was the key, wasn't it? And I did not, well, now we heard today that he's been in a coma for several days, and today he opened his eyes. And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, had we not gone? I mean, God could have used anybody else to be able to do that. I get that, because he's God. But I'm so glad my wife just didn't think twice about it, but decided that, no, this is the thing we need to do. And I'm glad that I went. But that also tells me that, Come on, man, if you're a bond slave, you should have picked that up. You should have known. You should have been on it right away. Why did you have to be, why, you know, why do, and that's, that's why marriages are good. When you forget, the other one remembers, amen? <laughs> Especially when you walk into a room and you don't know why you're there. <laughs> but that never happens to anybody here, right? Because we're all young. Anyway, but that's so important. And this is an evaluation. Look at your life. Am I a, am I a good, responsible bond servant of the Most High God? And usually the answer is going to be characterized on, do you remember what he did for you? If you remember what he did for you, then gratitude will well up. And because of gratitude, you will look for opportunities to be able to talk to people. Amen? Something that's kind of cute. Um, so what we did is decided to do is we had all this change. Change that was just lying around. So we just had, we had a bunch of change. And then I said, why don't, when, every time we see somebody that's homeless, you know, we never, we just, I'm always looking for change and stuff, but this way, let's put them in, in baggies, and then let's put a, a track, and let's put $2 worth of change in each one of these bags. So how many bags did we, did we end up doing? 60 bags, okay? Man, I didn't know that, mu that much. <laughs> I, I could really use that $120. No. <laughs> and so then we, we went ahead and we put them, we put them, so I have a whole bag, but man, if you, for whatever reason, if you want to avoid homeless people, carry these because we're ready to give them out now that we have them, right? And sure enough, they're on the other side or I, I have yet to be able to give one out. I'm looking for them like crazy because I want to, right? And now it's like I can't find them. Anyway, but that's just something that you can do. It's just a very simple thing to do and just get the word out and just you help them with some change. And then at the same time, you get a chance to witness to them and stuff. And then also make evangelists out of everybody. I, I keep telling you to do that. My wife did that the other day. We went to go get a mattress frame and stuff. And uh, uh, she said, oh, I got to get that, get some. some th so I see her grab a whole bunch of them. And so she goes to the manager, who's real nice and stuff, gave, her them, gave it to the manager. And then the manager started passing them out there in the store. And we could see them passing them out. And people are you know, stopping working and they're just, <laughs> they're reading it and stuff. But that's what we do, and that's what we have to have. So look at this barometer and figure out where you're at. Really important. This is what Paul will incur. This is what Paul will encourage all believers to do in Romans chapter 12. I beseech you. I ask you, please, you. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And, that, and do not be conformed to this world. One more time. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove 
what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's our job, to be able to do that. Verse 1 shows that Paul was not only a bond slave of the Messiah, but also an apostle. This means that he had the gift of apostleship, which, according to 1 Corinthians, is the most important of the 19 gifts of the Spirit. Furthermore, Paul was separated uh, was, was separated. In the Greek language, the term separated is the perfect passive participle of the verb aphrizo, which means that the apostle had been set apart in the past and in this state continued into the time of his writing. In the famous book of word pictures in the New Testament, a biblical scholar A.T. Robertson pointed out that Paul was a spiritual Pharisee, Pharisee separated not to the oral tradition, but to God's gospel, a chosen vessel. Robertson derived this conclusion from the fact that the term, that term right there in Hebrew, <laughs> aphorismenos, has the same root as the Greek translation of the Hebrew parush, which means separated one and refers to Pharisees. Paul used to be a Pharisee of Mishnaic, Mishnaic, Mishnaic Judaism, which was the following of the Mishnah, but now he was no longer that type of Pharisee. He was now a spiritual Pharisee totally set apart for the Messiah. And because he was totally set apart, he became a bond slave. Verse 1 continues by pointing out unto, Paul, unto what Paul was separated. He was separated unto the gospel of God. Three points can be made about the gospel that Paul preached. The first point comes from verse 1. The expression gospel of God is an example of a grammatical form known as genitive of, resource, of source. The source of, of the gospel Paul preached was God. God authorized the gospel. So it's important. The gospel he's saying is generated by God. It was not generated by Paul or Paulus or Saul or Shaul. It's always been generated by God and the Holy Spirit. Amen? The second point is given in verse 2. Paul was separated into the gospel, which he, God, promised afford through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The personal pronoun he refers to God. He has promised beforehand in the Hebrew Scriptures through his prophets the gospel that Paul preached. God was the source of this gospel, but the gospel, but this gospel was according to God's word. As mentioned in the introductory chapter of this commentary, Paul included roughly 60 quotations from the Hebrew scriptures in the letters to the Romans. These quotations prove that the gospel Paul preached was indeed according to the written word of God. The new message, the good news of the Messiah, did not contradict the Hebrew scriptures, but affirmed them. Of course they affirmed them. All the scriptures that talked about Jesus coming, all the scriptures that talked about when Messiah would come, all of those things were all in the Old Testament. Amen? Now the version, the, the, the way you say Old Testament in the Hebrew would be the Tanakh. In the Tanakh, it means that it's the whole area. And then you have the Law of Moses, which is a certain area, and then you have the writings and you have uh, the, the poetry. And, and those are three sections within the Old Testament. But all of the Old Testament is being used, and Paul uses it continually. Anybody tells you that Paul was not Jewish is crazy, or that he didn't refer to Jewish things or Jewish scriptures is just not knowledgeable of God's word. The third proof about the gospel that Paul preached is given in verse 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of who? Accordingly, as a Jewish good preacher, he is making sure that he makes the connection that Jesus is the son, uh, uh, was born in the seed of David. Why? Because he's also talking about the future. Since he didn't set up the kingdom, he will set up the kingdom in the future, and that's the millennial kingdom. Amen? When he rules. So that's the connection. Anytime you see Jesus and David put in the same scripture or in the same sentence, same verse, Always, there's always going to be that connection that makes you see that. Okay? And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. It may be summarized as follows. The gospel is centered in one specific person. It concerns God's Son. Verse 3 focuses on the Son's humanity concerning who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Over and over again, there will be an interplay between the Messiah's divinity and his humanity in this letter to show the uniqueness of this person as the God-man. Uh, I think in the Gospels, it's uh, Luke that makes that connection as the God-man. He talks about 
that more often. As to his humanity, he was a descendant of King David, and this statement connects Yeshua with the Davidic covenant that, 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 that the, the throne of David will be forever. Verse 4 shows his divine side, who is declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, even Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. What does it mean that Yeshua was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection? Does it mean that he became this Son by means of the resurrection? Absolutely not. The answer is no. Yeshua was already the Son before the resurrection. But the resurrection powerfully asserted his sonship and proved who he was. One of the things that I talk about whenever I share the gospel, I always, I always say, you know, I, I, you know, when I'm even praying, I said that he came, he, that, that he was, the gospel is very simple, that he came and he died for everyone, that's the death, and he was buried, that's the burial, and that he rose again to prove indeed that he is God. Not that he had to prove it, but the fact of his resurrection was an example of how much of a God he was or how great a God he is. In the resurrection, we find out that the scriptures talk about three people resurrecting Jesus. It talks about the Father, the power of the Father to resurrect Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of Jesus himself in the resurrection. So all three were involved in the resurrection. It's the resurrection that when you and I die, or we're getting close to dying, I'm not even talking about my dad, okay? But when we're getting close to dying, then that, at that point, you have to realize how precious that really is. Or when we see a loved one that passes away, and as a believer, we now see, man, it's so good that there's a resurrection. Amen? Amen. It's so good that this life is not the only thing we have to worry about. That's why he makes sure that he makes that connection that he is not just man, but from the seed of David, but also God who has the power over death. It says, a similar point is made in Acts 1731. Inasmuch as he appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who he has ordained, wherefore he has given assurance to all men that, that he has raised him from the dead. The resurrection of Messiah proved not only the issue of sonship, but also that the issues of sin was completely dealt with at the cross. It authenticated Yeshua's claim to deity and his prophecies that he would rise from the dead. The declaration of his deity came with power and according to the spirit of holiness, according to the flesh. Yeshua was the son of David, according to God's spirit, he was the Messiah. Paul ended Yeshua's identification by starting that he is our Lord. In verse 5, Paul further elaborates on his own relationship with the Messiah. It says, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. The we there is important because he's saying the we is as an apostle, as a fellow apostle of the 12 or the 11 in, in Jerusalem. <clears throat> I also have this authority. By the use of the pronoun, a plural pronoun we, Paul identified himself with the other apostles. He received his apostleship from Messiah just as they received theirs. Consequently, he possessed the gift of apostleship equal to that of all the other apostles. This was accomplished by his obedience of faith. This kind of obedience is not obtained through doing works or keeping commandments, but rather it is obtained through faith. <clears throat> that is how we come to know the Lord. Amen? It's only through faith. It's not works. <clears throat> it is necessary for salvation. By the mere exercise of faith, one believes the gospel and is saved. Paul went on to elaborate on this specific area of calling among all the nations. He was called to be the apostle to the Gentiles. The basis of his calling was for the Messiah's namesake. Having spelled out his own relationship with Messiah, Paul turned to the church in Rome and stated in verse 6, Of whom, of whom, ye, are, and whom are ye also called to be Yeshua, the Messiah's. The believers in Rome also belonged to Messiah. While they had not received the gift of apostleship, they shared in the gift of salvation with Paul. And this salvation came to them through Yeshua, through Jesus. Verse 7 provides the destination of this letter to all that are in Rome. Verse 7 provides the des destination of this letter. Uh, it says, to all that are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Everybody? Called to be what? Saints. Saints. Okay. Uh, I heard a pastor say, it says here that we are called to be saints. If you want to call me Saint Jesse, you may. Okay? But... <laughs> 
Nobody will. <laughs> the letter was addressed to the church in Rome. Paul declared that they were beloved of God and they were called to be saints or saints by way of calling. The term saint has three different usages in scripture. If you come from a Catholic background, we had a different version of what saint meant. Saint meant that if somebody had done a couple of miracles, two miracles that, that other people could verify and they had done good and followed Jesus or followed the church, then they could get honored as a saint and be called that. So it, it just meant that now you could pray to them, they could pray to Mary, Mary could pray to Jesus, and then because Jesus couldn't refuse his mother, has to grant you whatever you prayed for. That was the system. And it still is the system too much, too much, unfortunately. But the bottom line here is it's always been identified. The word saints has always been identified in scripture. To use it out of context, context is crazy. First, it is used to describe the member of a visible local church. That the, this, this place that we have here, Blessings Community Church, we are a church of saints, if everyone here is a believer, okay? Because all that means is just that you're a believer. Second, it, used to be, it is used to describe the members of the universal, or better, the invisible church, meaning the body of Messiah. Third, it is used to describe individual believers. In this case, the meaning of saint is holy, okay? Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what it is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Okay, the Colossians 1, 2, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Every concept, everything that we ever have about the word saint has to do with that. So if you're a believer, are you a saint? Absolutely. So that's good to know. The concept of this type of sainthood is that the person is set apart for God by virtue of his or her salvation. Having been sanctified by God, every believer is a saint, and this was also true of the recipients of Paul's letter. The passage ends, and with this I'll finish, the passage ends in verse 7b with a salutation, grace to you and peace or shalom from God our Father and the Lord Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. Grace is the Greek greeting and peace is a Jewish greeting. That's where you get shalom from. The source of the salutation is both God the Father and Yeshua the Messiah. In this teaching, we talked about the bond servant. In this teaching, we talked about whether you have still stayed within the area of being in unbelief, therefore your father is Satan, the devil. But if you make the transition where you accept Jesus, then you now become free to serve him as your master. And now as a bond servant, you've made the choice to serve him. And your level of love towards God will reflect your responsibility and your service. So look at your service and ask the question, as a believer, where am I as a bond servant up to God? And, and, and if you do that. The question, though, to finish off is this. Are you a slave of this world or are you a bond slave of Jesus the Messiah? And that's the key. There's only two forms of slavery in a sense. The slavery to sin and the bond slavery to our master, Jesus the King. And when we look at that and we start looking at it from those terms, then let's produce fruit. Amen? I want to finish with this illustration. In this illustration, the gold page represents heaven and what Revelations 21, 21 calls the streets of gold. This is a beautiful illustration in Revelation because that's where you really actually find out what all the, what, what's all going to be in heaven because he's given an actual uh, view of heaven. John is in the Revelation. And as he looks around, he's explaining all the things that he's seeing and he's being explained and what you're seeing here in Revelation is the architecture of how beautiful heaven is. The beautiful thing about heaven is not the architecture. The beautiful thing about heaven is the fact that this is where God lives. Amen? And because of that, all the security and the love and all the, all the, the great things that we'll, be, that we'll be experiencing will all be experiencing at his side, on his premises. The problem that we have is every one of us is trying to get there on our own good works. And we think that if we're compared to Hitler, we're better, then we must, we must be able to get into heaven on our own. 
But that's a problem because you're thinking that you just, don't, you just have to have a little bit of sin. But it says here that the, this clean page represents the perfection we would need to be able to get into heaven. And nobody's perfect. Have you ever lied one time? Raise your hand if you ever lied one time. If you haven't, you're a liar. And so that automatically raises your hand. So what we find out is if you can't have that, then the book of Romans really has a lot of passages that deal with this. First of all, Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. To say that you're not a sinner is to lie. But to admit that you're a sinner is to tell the truth because all of us have fallen short of that. Romans 3.10 says, is It is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. The problem with that, with sin, is that it will prevent us from going to hell, um, to, to heaven, but it will surely take us to the lake of fire in unbelief. The dark page represents our darkened hearts as a result of sin. It is in this condition that all of us as sinners find ourselves. We're all a mess, and as a result of that, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. And that first part there talks about the fact that death means forever being in torment in a place called the lake of fire. Forever. So when you think about heaven and when you think about the, the lake of uh, fire, think of it in terms of this. Everybody has eternal life. But some will be facing eternal life in the presence of God and others will be tormented forever in a place called the lake of fire. So it says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is the answer. The red page represents the shed blood of Jesus. The Bible gives us the answer to our problem. Our problem is we can't get there on our own. We're all a mess. But Jesus went to the cross, took three hours of what man could give him, spit on him, beat him, did everything but just get him to that point of, of, of just dying with torture. And then three more hours where the wrath of the Father came down on him on the cross. Those are my sins that he was paying for. Those are your sins that he was paying for. And it was only his precious blood. It could take only the blood of a perfect lamb, lamb of God, to be able to take that sin away. He is the answer to our problem. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It wasn't that we're such good people that died for us. It was the fact that we were sinners and we had a need and it was impossible for us to get into heaven any other way. Romans 10, 11 to 13 says, For the scriptures say, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? It doesn't get any clearer that those that have the Son have life. Those that have not the Son have not life. John 3.16 really puts, puts it in perspective and gives you an opportunity to think in terms of what, is God, what, what, what has God done for me. And, here, and very simply, John 3.16 is, For God the Father so loved the world, that's you and me, that's you and Gentile, that the Father gave His only begotten Son, Jesus, that whoever, whoever believes in Jesus should not, go, should not perish or go to the lake of fire, but instead have everlasting life in his presence. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's the good thing that we're looking for as a, as a person. Right now, I'd just like to just, it, now that we have an opportunity for those that are listening on the video, I just would like for you to just, if you have an opportunity right now, make the opportunity. God is calling you. Answer the call. And ask the Lord to come into your life. If you've never made this decision what are you waiting for? Make it now. Now's the time to start a brand new life. It's eternity. You have no idea what's going to happen in the next 20 minutes, the next day, the next year. We just had a recent pandemic that we've gone through and people didn't realize that it would be so difficult and so hard and so devastating for their families when they lost loved ones. But there's no guarantee that, that, that we'll have tomorrow as a day of life. Don't die in unbelief. Come to the Lord and ask the Lord to come into your life right now. I'm going to ask that just uh, bow your heads or just wherever you're at now. Let's just pray.
Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I realize that I can't do this on my own. I, I, I'm, I, I'm not perfect and I know that I've sinned a lot. But I also know that you came and you died on the cross for my sins. You were buried and you rose again on the third day to prove indeed that you are God. I put all of my faith in you. I believe that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come to the Father except by you. It's because of that that I will not put my faith in other people and other things, but only in you for my salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much that you were willing to die for me that I might have eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you've done that prayer, there are some other scriptures here that are just absolutely awesome. It says, therefore, it says, therefore having been justified by faith, in other words, coming to know the Lord, we have peace with God, amen, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And in Romans, Romans 8, 38 and 39, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, who is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the assurance that we have of a mighty God. For those of us that are believers, I just wanted to tell you that start looking at your role as a bondservant. Start looking at Jesus as the master. And what are we doing for the master? And the good thing about it is as we please the master, we feel great. We feel obedient. We feel like there's great things happening. And it gives purpose to each and every one of us. Because right now, if our purpose is to make the to financially to make the payments, if our purpose is to stay healthy because we don't want to get sick, if our purpose is to, uh, to, to get, have comfort, if those things are purpose, nothing wrong with those things. But if those are the main things, then we're missing the point. Our main issue is how faithful will we be to our king, to our master? It doesn't really matter what anyone in the world thinks. It only matters what our Lord thinks. And have the fear of the Lord in each one of us that says, everything that I do, the Lord is there. And because he's there, I don't want to do something that's inappropriate. And so once we do that, it turns out that you live a godly life. And there's peace and contentment with that. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys.